Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Spirits and Ghost Stories. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons. And Carly Bird. So, Tom, would you like to um, tell everyone what the story is going to be about tonight? Yeah, I'm super about excited that. about that. I actually have been wanting to do a story on this specific creature for a while. Perfect. Yeah. So, let's just restart. Sorry, we had a technical difficulty. I had to actually refresh my screen to get everything working, which yeah. was really weird because like I, I live streamed today from my other channel and there was no problem. So apparently there's a problem with this. So I don't know. That was different. It's always clunky uh, with spirits and ghost stories. It's, I know. I don't know why, and but I, it is. I feel bad about it because it's like this. It's not our fault. Because this is our, this is like, this is the baby. This has started everything. This is the firstborn. This is, oh. the, this is the first, yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is the firstborn 100%. son. And I feel bad because of like, ah, uh, you feel like shit because it kind of has to take all the hits. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And right. then like fishing the DMV is like you've got the, young... the growing pains here and you suffer through that. And then you kind of just like everything you've learned, you just apply to fishing the DMV. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Right. 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 And so I feel bad for this channel. And like, I get when your parents have multiple kids, because like the younger one, like, so anyway, it's um, okay. It's okay. Yeah. That's a weird thing. So no, I love all my siblings. That's not what I meant, but the point is anyway, so getting to it a little bit more. Yeah, no, we have a really cool story tonight. Um, you know, we missed uh, earlier episodes. We missed this week. This is the first week we've missed in over how many weeks, Carly? 32. 32 weeks. Yeah. It's been insane. We've gone 32 weeks straight with mm -hmm. doing this. And the same thing with fishing the DMV. I've not missed a single week ever since yeah. we did it. And so like in and of itself, guys, that's that to us is our accomplishment. It's this embarrassing and it's kind of like disheartening at the same time. But we didn't want to just BS our way through mm -hmm. it and bring you a story that was just zero quality. No, exactly. And we had some other issues come up because like it's not just issues. The fact is, I mean, we're not going to lie about it. It's not a humble. It's not a brag or whatever. It's just the reality on the ground is fishing the DMV is taking off. Right. It really is. It's growing really big. I'm in college and I'm still working. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that's probably making money right now. So I have more time into that and it sucks. And hopefully we can get this to the point that we can get it monetized too yeah. and we can get some help. But we are still going to do this no matter what because this is so much fun mm -hmm. and I really enjoy it. Yeah. But yeah, so today's story, we're going to kind of do this a little bit differently than we usually do. Oh yeah, we've got a new setup. Technically, you are still in the week. I love you, Carol Ann. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I've said originally. I was like, you know what? As long as it's before Sunday, mm -hmm. we're still in the week and I don't have to feel that guilty about it. Yeah. Thank you, Carol Ann. Huge shout out to you. you know, huge shout out to Carol Ann and Tess and uh, Linda Ahrens and um, Chris Everett and everyone else that are um, that are watching us. Our super vans. Um, yeah. And oh, I have one person to ask them. For anyone that wants to know um, what the spirits are tonight for Spirits and Ghost Stories, it's um, Silver Tequila, Margaritaville, uh, little shots for like 99 cents a piece. And that's how we afford alcohol these days. Perfect. That's off. That's off. Okay, I don't cool. mix it with anything. And now we, we get into it. We just drink it straight. Did okay. you just say three, two, one? Uh, yes, I did. What's going on? Uh huh. I am just getting everything all geared up for us. Okay. Cause um, you know. Thanks. Anyway, tonight we are doing things a little bit differently. Usually, um, one or the other person does the history as well as the story. However, this evening, Thomas is going to do the history on this mythological beast, and I'm going to do the story. So we get to kind of share it. Yeah, we do. And, and I think this was really a smart idea because you're a fantastic storyteller and we're really playing to our strengths. And this this story here is one of the coolest stories I've ever actually seen. Um, it's a mystery story. I want to have a huge shot to my sister. Uh, she's the one that really kind of got this thing going. Um, she's the one that made me kind of like investigate it. And this story? Yeah, this Recently? story here. Yeah, I, I forgot completely about this one. We should be reaching out to her yeah. and watch this well, live stream. So it is called the Dante Pass Whoa. Incident. What's going on? What's going on? I, don't, I had to respond to that. Okay. If I wasn't drunk at my in-laws, I definitely would. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So anyway, so today's story is the Dante Pass incident. Okay. So this is a really, really neat thing because this actually happened. This literally did happen in Russia. Let me get 
this up here to kind of guys kind of show you guys kind of what happened. You're going to let them read along with you? No. Oh, I thought you were sharing I, your screen with them. Yeah, because I'm going to try to show them exactly what happened here. So. Oh, ooh, pictures. Yes, there's a lot of pictures. And for anyone that has kids at home, there are going to be dead bodies in this one, a bunch of dead bodies. Um, cause these, this is actually the event that actually did happen Carolyn, in real life. Shield Tilly's eyes right now. Yeah. Shield, shield Tilly's eyes. So basically, um, trying to throw these pictures up on the screen so everyone can see them. There was a, a group of individuals that went out into the mountains, the Ural mountains in Russia, and they never came back. A search party went out for them. Yeah. And what they found was shocking. What was even more shocking was after the Soviet Union investigated the whole incident, their findings of what happened. And this ties into the tale that you have about this incident and some of the theories that kind of get along with it. Now, my job in this tale is to paint a path that starts at zero and ends at the death of nine young college individuals. And it's not just that they died. It's the mountains. It's cold. Things happen. It's crazy. But it's around the deaths that's really crazy about this story. What did they find? You're going to find out in today's timeline shout out to dan cummins i love you but the fact is this is really like amityville where it's like this happened and there's actually government data whether it was like amityville where the cops came in and like we don't know what happened yeah this is a, an investigation journal here um and so with this thing here we're gonna kind of get in the timeline of exactly what happened because guys it is uh it's pretty crazy. Now, why Max flip around the screens like this? I have no idea, but I hate it to my core um, so much. There we go. Question. You um, are you going to tell us what the beast is? Oh, we're going to get there. On January 27th, 1959, nine very experienced young hikers set off into the Ural Mountains a few hundred miles north of Shurvenk, now Yervinkians on a two week mountain hiking trek. Sadly, none of these individuals would return. None of them? None of them would return, none of them. And what happened to them, that's kind of the crazy part. As they pushed through the hostile climate towards the base of the mountain, they were hit with snowstorms that ripped through the narrow. That's fine, they can still see it. As they pushed through the hostile climate towards the base of the mountains, they were hit with snowstorms that ripped through the narrow passes. Decreasing visi visibility caused the team to lose their sense of direction. And instead of moving towards the, the Entente, which is basically the cap of the, of, the, of the mountain, they accidentally deviated west and found themselves on the slope of the nearby mountain. Oh. This mountain is known as Kalholt Sarvak. Now, guys... If you've been with me since episode one, you know I suck at speaking English. Um, that will continue today because a lot of these names are in Russian and I can't even speak American very well. So, yeah. <laughs> this mountain is known as Karhonk, well. meaning dead mountain in the language of the indigenous Man Mananese people of the region. To avoid losing the altitude, they had gained on perhaps simply because you know the team wanted to practice camping on a mountain slope before their ascent to the to the peak called they called camp there and made for the night it was on this solitary mountainside that all nine hikers of the daltev pass incident would meet their demise and and, and honestly just for you to kind of like get an idea of this so these are the individuals. Okay. These are some of them. Okay. And again, I will be showing uh, for the individuals that do watch this, not live, there will be a lot of dead bodies in this photo. These are actually criminal photos, not criminal, but these are basically investigatory photos that actually happened afterwards. So um, how many people were there again? Nine. Nine. Nine individuals went up. No one came back. Okay. So again, you will be getting photos of this as we continue. Okay. So just. Can you get rid of that comment? Guys? Hmm? There's no need to add that comment there on this one. Screen. Thank you. Oh, forgot. So this is now being a cunt. All right. Perfect. So now what? When February 20th rolled around and there was still no communication from the hikers, a search party was mounted. 
The volunteers, the volunteer rescue force that trekked through the Dante Pass found the campsite, but no hikers. So military and police investigators were sent to determine what had happened to the missing team. When they arrived on the mountain, the investigators were hopeful that they would find something through the group was made up of experienced hikers. So clearly, like all these all these people were of college age except one. Okay. All of them were below the age of 25. <laughs> they come from a Russian university where like hiking and trekking on mountains, this is like their thing. So the fact is this is wasn't like a bunch of people from like say California gotcha. going out. So to, they like, weren't just like willy nilly oh, yes. on the mountain for the first time yes. ever. They were actually no, experienced. It, it was, yeah, it was none of that people. Stuff. And that's what makes this this whole thing just just so less and they were all experienced so they should have been able to like work together to get through it but then none of them came back no none of them came back and that's okay. what's just so crazy about this so when they arrived on the mountain the investigators were hopeful that because the group was made up of exceptional hikers and and mountaineers the route they had chosen was remarkably difficult mm. but there was still hope that there would still be signs of life the accident on these and these tricky mountain trails were really dangerous, but they still had faith. When the when the hikers having been missing for so long, investigators expected to find an an open and shut case of, you know, a stereotypical hypothermia, avalanche, something like that is what right. they kind of really were expecting. Right. Some kind of natural disaster. They were partially correct though. They found bodies, all right. But it was the state that they found the bodies in that brought in the force of the Soviet Union government to shield what had happened and a cover up was started. Oh no. The state in which the bodies were found only raised more questions. Starting on February 26, the discovery of the bodies opened up the true mystery of the Dantilov past incident that continues to this day in 2022. Investigators of Dante Pass stumbled upon a shocking scene. When investigators arrived at the campsite, the first thing they noticed was that the tent had been cut open in a way that soon proved to be from the inside and that it was nearly destroyed. Meanwhile, most of the team's belongings, including several pairs of shoes, had been left there at the campsite. Shoes were left, meaning they woke up and just ran. They woke up cut a hole in their tent they didn't go through it they, they used the knife and cut open the side and all of them burst out this is in december this is in i'm sorry february in russia it's okay. cold as shit so the coldest part of the yes year. they didn't discover eight of the nine sets of footprints from the team many of them clearly made by people with either nothing socks or a single shoe on their feet mm. These tracks led to the edge of the nearby woods, almost a mile away from the camp. At the forest edge, under a large cedar, the investigators found the remains of a small fire in the first two bodies, Yuri Kurvenkovich, 23, and Yuri Dorokovich, 21. Despite the temperatures of negative 13 degrees <laughs> to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit mm -hmm. on the night of their death, both bodies were found shoeless, and only in their underwear. That's how they were found. Okay. Frozen underneath the cedar tree. Okay. No idea what happened. And they did, did they look like they died of hypothermia? Mm -mm. No. They, they they at the time they did they didn't know why they died. Okay. Now now like at the time they didn't know they died of hypothermia. Okay. Now they do. Okay. Because of some other incidences that we're going to get into in the story. All right. But again, it, it this is kind of like why it's like. Uh, tr so these, these are the first two bodies that they found. These are the first two bodies that they, they found. And they do some research on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Then so what? these bodies number, these are the first two bodies that we're going to be talking about mm -hmm. here. They then found the next three bodies. Those of Dantev Sendiaya Korovinich. She was 22. And Roster Shlandia. I'm sorry, I'm trying my best, 23, who died on their way back to the camp from the cedar tree. Okay. They died on their way back to camp. Frozen, absolutely solid. But they, but again, the idea that, okay, this is what you have to understand. They were all in the camp. These are all experienced hikers. Mm -hmm. There was no avalanche. Right, right. They cut their way out of the tent. Yeah. 
in and a, then just a ran panic. for a mile, then lit a fire. Then, then they all separated. They were all cognitive, died, apparently. Some of them didn't. They were all cognitive. Yeah. This is what was so weird about this thing. Like, where were the drugs? What drugs were involved here? I don't think any. And this is kind of where it's going to get really, really crazy. Okay. Get my place. While the circumstances were odd, investigators found that the cause of their death were clear. All the hikers, they up to this point, they said, had perished from hypothermia. Their body showed no indication of severe external damage beyond what had inflicted by the cold. However, that wasn't the case for all the bodies. What about the others? So the remaining hikers were found in a ravine near a shelter. They attempted to carve out of the snow. Niki Therberiaxi, 23-year-old grad student, had, ca had a caved-in skull, <gasps> while 24-year-old Alexei Kervin had a deformed neck and was missing his eyebrows. What? The oldest hiker, Sherion Kolvecki, 20-year-old, had a crushed chest with multiple broken ribs. Both were missing their eyes, and Lydian was missing her tongue. What? Six of these group members died of hypothermia. They know that. Three of them died from fatal injuries from their bodies, yeah, a contusion, like being crushed or being attacked. That was not even the weirdest part. So let's just really get these facts straight right here. Yeah. The tin had been ripped open from within. Mm -hmm. The victims had died six to eight hours after their last meal. Mm -hmm. The camp, all, all from the camp, traces, blah, 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 traces from the camp show that all the group members left the campsite of their own accord. They all broke out of their tent, mm -hmm. were cognitive left the tent in groups completely naked for some reason and then died right some of them from hypothermia but some of them died from fatal injuries and one of them died from something quite interesting because on one of those patients lakirov they found levels of radiation on her clothes radiation radiation nuclear radiation was found on the clothes explain that an alien to dispose of the theory of an attack of the indigenous Mayan people stated that the fatal injuries of the three bodies could not have been caused by human beings because the force of the blows had been so strong and no soft tissue had been damaged at the same time. And so the indigenous people were waved out that they didn't do this. And yet this was such a big mystery that the Soviet Union covered it up for many years until it was like, until it was finally opened up when the Soviet Union fell in the, the late 1980s. Now, okay. here are the three main theories, and this kind of gets us into our tale for the day uh -huh. of what actually happened. Uh -huh. The first theory, the, the first theory, early on, it was theorized that the Soviet authorities may have been killed by the Mayans, which are an indigenous people of the region. The idea that the hikers were slaughtered by the straying aborigines that lived on these lands. Hold on, the Mayans? Yeah. M-A-N-S-I. Indigenous the people of the Mancy? region. The Mensi. The idea that the hikers were slaughtered for straying onto sacred land. Or perhaps as part of some kind of ritual. Mm -hmm. Much was made about the, the, the idea that these aboriginous people were the ones that did the slaughter. This has been rattly debunked, though, mm -hmm. as baseless theories rooted in a misunderstanding of the culture and rituals of these individuals. And if there were indeed rounded up and murdered, why were the bodies found in different locations? Right. Some more injured than others. Right. Furthermore, as we talked about earlier, the force done to these people could not have been done just by regular human beings. No. Their skulls were crushed in. Right. Their chest was broken. Mm -hmm. Radiation was found on one of the bodies. Right. The tongue was missing. Where the heck is the radiation? Well, I mean, second theory. Eyes, tongues and eyes. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, true. But here's the second theory. Two members of the group had been the focus of a particular speculation. <gasps> Why was Simeon, a 37-year-old veteran of World War II, attached to this group of young students and grad students oh wait a minute he's the only one that was that was the oldest he's yes. the only one that was like out of college age right mm -hmm. okay. he was the only one that was out of college age okay. why was he there right furthermore it is significant that a few years earlier yuri 
uh, Kravinsky helped clear up a radioactive leak at a secret Soviet Union facility, an incident which has since been compared to the Chernobyl disaster. Mm -hmm. According to one theory, these two individuals were working for the KGB and had joined, sorry, and had joined the Divyansk Trek to be Alela. Had joined, I'm trying so hard with these words. You got had it, joined the Divion's track to prevent a CIA agent in the rural mountains from uncovering a Soviet Union plot. Okay. While handling over radioactive materials and fake nuclear tests, the Russians were supposed to take photos of the American agents. The theory goes that the CIA men got wise to what was going on leading to a fight breaking out and the eventual massacre of everyone in the party. Those are the two primary theories as to what happened. But there is a third. Okay. And this gets into our today's tale because this is the one that the natives mm -hmm. pitch, which is that of the Yeti. The idea that the group was killed by a Yeti a few pieces of dubious evidence is around that makes sense. The first is a photo taken by one of the doomed hikers, which shows a dark humanoid figure seemingly shrunk behind a tree. But was this a fearsome figure from, an, from a time long ago or simply a blurred image of another hiker? The second item is cited by the indigenous people that talk about the demons of the mountain that have frightened many hunters away during the spring and summer months. These are the two, this is the biggest theory about what happened. And this mm -hmm. kind of gets us into today's tale. So first off, before we get into your story, what do you think mm -hmm. about all that? I think that's crazy. And I'm not really sure where the Yeti ties into uh, radioactivity. Well, I think it's the fact that like, it's like, so like example here, like here's another body mm -hmm. that was found. And, and again, it's really hard to see. Like, this is a body that was found in the river. Mm -hmm. Like, it was dragged and dropped into the river. Two of them were. It's just so strange that they weren't eaten. What do you mean? Well, usually if it's a beast or some kind of animal, then the bodies are eaten or mangled in some way. Not just, like, destroyed. You know, but not just killed and then left. Because dead, if it's I mean? a yeti or something yeah. like that, a primate, yeah, it could be territorial. Okay. That the Yeti, it was his territory, okay. and it was not because so he was trying to hungry, eat. If he wasn't hungry, then he was just trying to, like, yeah. get them away he from us. Maybe they them. got too close to his house or his home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so that's what's interesting. The weird thing about this story, that uh, there's so many things about this story that are so crazy to me. And, like, the fact, like, it wasn't just hypothermia for all of them. Right. How did that person's chest get caved in? Right. They all How died person... a different way. Yes. Yeah. And then there's radiation. And then their tongues and eyes are missing. But not on all of them. Just right. a few of them. Right. That doesn't make sense either. No. And the fact that they all broke up into separate groups. Mm -hmm. Why would they break up into separate groups? Yeah, why groups? didn't they stay together? And why Especially they, if they were And why didn't they go back build. into the tent? Yeah. Because the tent was fine. Yeah. The tent wasn't like, it wasn't like buried in an avalanche. Right. Why did they leave the tent? And come back. What did they hear? Because I think that's what it was. Yeah. Deep down in my, my... They heard something and they knew they needed to like flee the area. They had to flee so fast that yeah. they had to cut a hole in the tent. Right. So in my belief, I think what happened is there was something out there that scared the crap out of them. Yeah. They cut a hole in the tent and mm -hmm. they ran like hell. Mm -hmm. Then they realized what had happened and they tried to make their way back to the tent, but it was too late at that point. And I think a couple of them probably got attacked by this thing because that would explain why they all ran into separate pairs. Yeah. Because whatever it was, went after a few of them. Those are the people that had the, the horrible injuries. Yeah. The other ones froze to death. Makes perfect sense. Right. The ones that were the fastest froze to death. The slower ones were yeah. the ones that got mangled. Yeah. And those are the ones that, that had the, the trauma, the blunt force trauma to them. Yeah. That to me makes the most sense. Right. Because if you were a primate like that and everyone, like they know this with chimpanzees and apes, or chimpanzees and gorillas, they're okay. like the silverback is very territorial. Yeah. And you think of a silverback very gorilla. True. Very true. That thing is so strong. It doesn't have to do much to hurt you, mm -hmm. but it's not trying to like eat you. It's just trying to get you out of the territory. Right. If that if a silverback gorilla in this example, let's say they were camping in the rainforest, well, monkeys have like the strength of like twenty five men put yeah. together. Example, yeah, yeah, and they're only like this tall. So basically, going with what I was saying, <clears throat> if you were camping in the rainforest and you were in the territory, let's say of, of gorillas, yeah, 
and the silverback came up to the tent, mm -hmm. all that if it if it caught one of you and started beating the crap out of him, you ought to You're all flee. All leave, right? You'd all flee, right. right? Yeah. So whatever this was gets one or two of them. Everyone else flees. What happens? They're like, oh shit, we're gonna die out here. Mm -hmm. A couple of them try to make a shelter. Mm -hmm. everyone else tries to get back to the tent, but right. it's too late because it's like negative 15 degrees. Right, right. That to me makes the most sense because there was no avalanche. There was no burn marks on the inside of the tent. There I was think, no fire. All right. I think they just heard him like screaming or something. What do you guys down in the comment section below, what do you guys think it is? Yeah. And then that kind of gets us into uh, to your tale, right, Carly? Right, right. So um, while I start reading this, do you mind pulling up um, some pictures maybe of what you think the Yeti uh, looks like? Uh, absolutely. I would really like some visuals on what we think the Eddie looks like. I I think you say primate, so obviously we're thinking like a gorilla shaped. Well, that's what like beast. like a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch or right, 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 right. But also like the abominable snowman is also very similar to the Yeti. So time now for the tale of the Yeti. I was hardly known as a courageous man, so you could imagine my surprise when my master, who I was currently working under, for a fair amount of wage, stood up from his black leather couch and announced to the whole room, Grab your things, Charles. We shall be embarking upon an expedition. Just below, just following a somewhat aged documentary about Mount Everest and the local legends of a terrible beast, the Yeti, which wandered the mountain. Erwin Baker had always had a fascination with the unknown. As his valet, I was inclined to listen to his frequent ramblings of the occult and supernatural, and occasionally even partake in the occasional ritual that he claimed would grant immortality or some other fanciful enhancement. Perhaps it was because he was so rich that life just didn't hold its element of surprise as much any longer, and this was just one of its many attempts to stave off boredom. Either way, I do not claim to know, and soon we had traveled from London to Rome, Rome to Turkey, and finally the long journey from Turkey to Nepal. Nepal was a freezing place, might I say. The air was thin and locals were more than happy to relieve us of a few pounds in exchange for supplies for our rather impromptu expedition. <laughs> we had gathered a team of rough and ready sort, and our guide, who went by the name of Lawrence Fisher, had vexed me from the very beginning. He bore a greasy black handlebar mustache and a head of similar colored hair and carried himself as if he was a prince. My master and I must have shared the same loathing, but he had claimed to have made it to the top and down five different times. Lawrence also claimed to have made arrangements, and after taking it, staying in Nepal for a night, we began our trip to the base of the Great Mountain via bus. My master was a little upset at its condition. It was rusty and worn, and rattled, rattled us every time we encountered a slight, slight bump in the road, but he managed to at least prevent other passengers from coming aboard and mucking up the trip more than it already was. The trip to the mountain lasted two days, and as I stared blankly out the window and into the hilly surroundings, I couldn't help but feel some apprehension about going on such a journey. Of course, I didn't really believe that yetis existed, and all the different rituals my master had made me do ended in failure, but even so, these lands had a sort of mysticism about them, something distinctly unknown. We arrived at the base of the mountain about noon, and when we pulled up to a small lake by the name of Imja, we saw an old run-down shack beside it. Lawrence led the group to the shack. This crusty older man was inside, the foul-smelling place who communicated only in sign language. Lawrence translated the various signs to something like, Footsteps in the middle look for caves. I thought my master would be upset at such a vague news, but he gave the man a thankful nod to my surprise and said, Gentlemen, we have our course. Everyone present shared my surprise as he walked off back to the parked bus, but a few mumbles and shrugs were exchanged, and from there we moved on. 
Yet another three hours later, we reached a different part of the mountain, and the bus drove away this time. Lead the way, Mr. Fisher, spoke my master with a cheerful voice, and we were on our way up. At this point, the air was dry, but not as cold as you may imagine. Sure, it was quite frigid, but the weather was quite bearable with all the coats and layers we wore. I suppose the best thing I could say about our expedition was the beautiful surroundings, with massive valleys of green and incredible views of the nearby landscape. The mountain loomed farther than we could see, and the snow underneath our feet was crunchy. Camping on Mount Everest was a painful affair, considering the bitter cold bit into that we faced at night, and further up we went. But we all made it through and continued to follow Lawrence the next morning. After about a day of travel, we made camp at the flattest piece of ground we could find. It was about 2.30 when Lawrence stopped dead in his tracks, according to my watch, about 15 feet ahead, and with a jubilant expression, turned to us and began shouting, We are on the trail, my friends! Look! When my master and I approached where he was standing, and we were both equally shocked by the outline of what appeared to be an oversized foot in the ground, Irwin looked more overjoyed, while I must have seemed quite horrified by what I saw before me. All these years, I imagined that the picture, pictures of the footprints upon the slopes of Everest had all been staged, but the frightening reality of what was before me hit harder than I imagined. Even so, I kept my best poker face and couldn't help but grin a little at just how enthusiastic my master appeared. Usually, past the twinkle in his eyes, one could see a hint of boredom within him. It was gone now, and I thought that was a good thing, to be quite honest. The people who were with us just stood there, most with expressions of disbelief. One rubbed his eyes while the other raised a hand to his mouth. <laughs> there was a little hesitation within the men as we pressed on, following the scattered prints to find where they led. Looks to be a snowstorm in the mark in the making, Lawrence announced, picking up his pace. We must find our Yeti before it sets in. I do not know how he knew this, but he stomped up the snowy slopes at double time, and my master and I followed suit. There was a childish spark of adventure in me that evened out with the initial shock of seeing the mark in the snow. Perhaps I am just a weird person at heart, but Irwin's pure enthusiasm was contagious. Another night went by. The prints were beginning to grow more and more discernible. At first, the outline was very faint, but the marks were clearer as we continued our progress up the mountain. Three huge toe-shaped extremities and a giant main section. Simple enough, but nonetheless frightening. A couple of men had snapped some photographs of the prints we had found, as my master demanded. We had even taken an old Polaroid along to ensure none of the evidence would be lost. It was another day of travel, and things were getting much colder. The air was starting to become more thin, but we still pressed on. Flurries were falling from the slightly darkened sky now as we walked, but we were hardly enough to cover up the trails or footprints. At night, we made a camp. A boy named Anoki who was a native of the region, approached me in my tent with a grave expression on his youthful face. Why does your master wish to find the Yeti? He asked. Mm. Mr. Irwin is a man of variety, I replied, in a proud manner. He wishes to be the first to find the Yeti and prove it exists. Anoki just stared at me blankly for a while. I did not think that we would find Yeti. I will be leaving tomorrow. You should do the same. And with those ominous lines, he ducked out of my tent and left me there to ponder. The next morning, he was nowhere to be found, and a little of our supplies had gone missing. My master didn't hold it against him, bless his soul, and acted as though nothing even happened. A few rumors flew around here and there about why Anoki had left, but soon the rest of us forgot about him and we were on our way again. Today was the day we found where our footprints led to. It was just eight in the morning when we stumbled across the gaping maw of a cave in the distance. Sure enough, the prince went right to it. We had all gathered at the entrance and stared into the murky abyss and ap with apprehension. 
even Lawrence didn't have his usual confidence confident look on his face anymore. The atmosphere was silent and with awkward and awkward for a time before I spoke up. I know it was completely uncharacteristic uh, uncharacteristic of me, but my curious I know curiosity that word. I know, good job, baby. <laughs> curiosity about what was inside the cave had piqued my interest. I shall go in first. Everyone looked at me and nodded in a grateful way including my master, who also appeared a little proud. For a time, I swung my arms and cleared my throat in preparation, looking around at the expectant stares around me as I took a step forward. I will be going in now, I restated, slowly taking a step forward and the letting the dark... The balls. I'll tell now. I, I like, know. You're not paying me for this. Crazy. And the cave engulfed me. Thankfully... We were equipped with heavy-duty flashlights for such a circumstance, and as I entered, I turned mine on. As I progressed through it, the whole cave lit up in brilliant pale yellow. There wasn't the usual dripping of water one would expect to hear within a cave, considering any water was probably frozen in these conditions. The tunnel snaked around a bit, forcing me through a section of left and right turns very rigidly. While the walls were actually considerably close to each other, hmm. the ceiling was almost higher than I could see upwards. The cave continued on a further before further before terminating in one giant cavern ahead. The ceiling was far closer to the ground here, but whitish blue ice had crept into the walls and ceiling for some odd reason until it all but covered the whole area it was quite strange i thought considering i had seen no such thing within the tunnel area even stranger there was no need for my light here because the roof of the cave had a jagged hole within it that led the light of the sun cascade through the ice formations nearby. Hundreds of miniature ice, icicles hung from the intact part of the roof, but what took my breath away was the sight of a half-skeleton hanging upside down with the skull and bones of its upper body scattered haphazardly on the freezing floor below. Get the fuck out of there. I put my hand to my mouth, and now it was not only the cold that sent a chill down my spine. Bloody bones belonging to various creatures were littered all across the place. But what disturbed me the most was how many of them were human. Some were hard to distinguish because they lay in messy piles with other bones of different creatures. Still, the ones in plain sight were enough to let me know that we had most certainly found our yeti. My heart nearly stopped as my eyes slowly looked over the rest of the cave, but to my immense relief, the beast must not have been at home at the moment. I almost That's couldn't, worse. I almost couldn't bring myself to snap a Polaroid before I left, but had managed to do so. When I showed the image when I showed the image to the ground to the group outside, everyone seemed just as frightened as I had been. That included my master, who, with an unsavory look upon his face, said, Gentlemen, I believe we have what we came for. It is time to depart. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is such a, that's such a British gentleman way to be like, Gentlemen, let's get this, the fuck out of here. Let's get the fuck out of here. But you keep like, like you see like a little top hat, like, all right, guys, let's... Uh, <laughs> you did your job. Thank you very much. Good job. Ta-da. Now get me out of here. Not one man raised a protest of any sort, and soon we began sent. Who would be like, no, it's fine. No, let's go check it out. Soon we began descend- descending the great mountain slope once again. I suppose when we saw that picture, Irwin knew just what he was getting himself into, and the risk outweighed the reward. We, like many others, had gathered what little information we could and would not be pushing our luck. But I'm afraid that the tale doesn't end there. For as we stomped our way down the mountain at a reasonable rate, we were engulfed with a blizzard that descended upon us in what felt like a few minutes. The whole world was cloaked in a powdery way, and soon I had to struggle in order to see five feet in front of me. I made it a priority to stay by my master all the way, who plodded onwards with his gloves batting the air ahead in an attempt to aid his vision. 
Well, Lawrence did warn us, I shouted, trying to stay as, pos as positive as possible. Indeed he did, but not of how fast it would happen, came the reply, and to be honest, I couldn't refute this. It had been about an hour of incessant walking, and I was sure we must have lost some men by this point. I could see none of the nearby surroundings, only an endless amount of snow and a barren wasteland beneath my feet, which I had trouble feeling. Just as though, just as I thought things could not possibly get any worse, a terrible, oh, hold on, cacophony of, I can't read that word, cacophony of roars filled the air through the unbearable howling of the wind. The noise was so loud that the ground underneath our feet shook as it was about to give way, and I fell face first into the snow. The frozen liquid stung my already chilled flesh, but I rose back to my feet in order to join my master once again. The scream sounded unearthly. It is hard to describe, but I would liken it to the sound of a thousand li lions roaring at once mixed with the cries of a hundred children back to back everyone get back to back right fucking now yep let's go don't Hold hands yeah chain chain yeah like, chain together. honestly like this is not you separate out and disperse nope. no, like, no 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 no, no. Back everybody back. get together it was terrifying to say the least and my master and i began running faster than ever where are you weather. running to like how far away is hopefully distant? they have like a compass in front of them we became fueled a by adrenaline in front of them no 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 like holding okay compass, got it like holding it out like this it. in front of this it's not so a video they... game where she's like oh, shut up <laughs> we became fueled by adrenaline as something from behind us slowly began growing more and more noticeable a oh. rhythmic rumble shook the ground like the roar but to a lesser extent but it sounded suspicious frightening in a primitive way as if a man had grown three stories tall and was sprinting towards us from what little i can recall of this my theory must not have been far off because we had a horrible scream from behind that momentarily pierced the veil of wind before fading into the frozen oblivion for good with pure fear to spur us on, we began almost stumbling down the mountain. After what felt like hours, the storm was starting to let up, enough for me to see the f figure of Lawrence Fisher lagging slightly behind us and occasionally glancing back into the storm in fear. The only memory I have of the beast itself is the massive hairy arms that momentarily reached out from the cloak of snow to grab the entirety of his torso and drag him screaming at the top of his lungs for help into the ocean of murky white. That thing must not have been far behind, but I believe we are all still alive today because our team bought the two of us time. Erwin and I didn't stop running until we were away from the storm, and even then we were sure to behave as if paranoid. And after Three days of no sleep and exhausting travel, we managed to stumble down off that godforsaken mountain and back to the closest thing to civilization that was nearby. Beside my master and I, only one man made it off that mountain alive, and it was the boy Anoki, who we actually ended up meeting on the way down. He had been traveling at a much slower pace, you see, and was more than happy to share the food he had taken with us. Son of a bitch. Water wasn't exactly much of a problem, though, as you may imagine. The three of us made our way back to the village. After exchanging our horrifying tale and after thanking the boy, we booked a flight black back to Turkey. I am recording our story and make of it what you will. But please, if you value your life, do not visit Mount Everest for something lurking there amongst its frozen slopes. I am waiting and hunting i am waiting and hunting its prey something that is truly horrifying and that was the tale of the yeti i like how the snow almost became like the ocean you know like you know how like a shark fin will like break the water <laughs> and then like it'll like you, you'll see the shark because fin it was a second. storm yeah because like, and you couldn't see very far only a couple feet yeah and like to me like that was like that's what's so freaking like i don't know how scary about that like because like i listen to like shark attack stuff guys online that's a good point. and like so it's like when a person's taken it's like you just see like the ocean surface and the person like just gets underneath the waves yeah 
it's creepy because it's the same thing with the snow almost like how in case anyone it. didn't know thomas is obsessed with the sharks and shark the attacks. sharks yeah you literally have an app on your phone that lets you know anytime there was a shark attack in the world so yeah he's obsessed Anyway, uh, Carol Ann says, most gorillas and primates are herbivores. I understand that, Carol Ann. However, um, the Yeti apparently is not. But the point is, do you know what an herbivore is? Yeah. Herbivore, it means it only eats like veggies. Yeah, but it would still, it, in my point. No, an omnivore eats both. Anyway, my whole point was the fact that it would still attack people if it got close to its tribe. Not that the gorillas oh, or that monkeys ate would, it. Not that the gorillas or monkeys would eat the people, but just the fact that they would kill them if it got close to like you know its group and it would protect it. Right. The same thing like I think a wild stallion would do the same thing. Like a, you know they're not kapowushkas, but they would still <laughs> you know, Remington would still protect his mares from you. So oh, you know, that's what I'm saying. Oh, but that Lord. right there, that was a that was a freaky story. That was really scary. Um, and you know, guys, to kind of like give you an idea of kind of what they look like, we're gonna we're gonna whip up an image. If you guys don't like, come on, if you don't know what an Eddie, Yeti looks like, like where have you been? An abominable snowman, yeah. white, furry, gigantic, and strong. Yeah. Oh, so I mean, that's what the Yeti looks like. It's supposed to be part of the a primate fam family. Yeah, um, actually, it's long ass arms. Yeah. So based on my notes here, the Yeti is believed to be one of the missing links, it's just like Bigfoot or Sasquatch, right. probably uh, probably the same genotype. They're related. Yep. And it probably actually descended from China or India is where it came from. Oh, yeah. So now I think I think the Yeti or Bigfoot are actually real. I do. I think <gasps> something like that is real. Wow. Yeah, 100 percent. Tom's leveling us because right now. now the type of it, though, hear me out. Okay. I think a massive primate like this definitely exists. Okay. Is it still around? I don't know, but it's the same thing with like the megalodon. Uh, the megalodon is a great white, gigantic shark. shark that did exist, and the oceans are massive. Right. With so the, Jason Statham. Yeah. Exactly. Good. Good job, Carly. So, but my point is with with the megalodon is the fact that humans have been around long enough that did one of our ancestors see a megalodon? Yeah, probably. Or a big enough shark to be like, yep, yeah, this this monster exists. Do I think that the Yeti's around now? Probably maybe not. Maybe Bigfoot's not. But I do think that probably our ancestors probably did see something like this in the woods. Um, and so and because it's been around in every culture too. Mm -hmm. You know, like no matter what continent you go to, tribes have some kind of hieroglyphics or cultural um resemblance to a bigfoot or a sasquatch or a yeti right and that's what's weird right to me is like when every continent besides antarctica so kind of giant but they all look the same thing but they don't all you know it, it, think about this if you were a tribe in france mm -hmm. or you know in um the himalayas or the rockies or appalachia or the canadian wilderness all of you have this picture of a suspect let's mm -hmm. say this is a murder case right all these people that aren't related basically tell you what the suspect is and you end up drawing the same person. Right, right. And then you bring them all together later on and, and like, they oh, all literally the are person. the same thing. That's right. crazy to me. And so it's like, at that point, it's gotta be like, there's gotta be some truth to this thing. Yeah. Um, Carol Ann, uh, do you believe? And anyways, I bring this up to everyone that's listening, you yeah. know, whether it's live Anyone. or not. Do you believe in the idea of a homo sapien, uh, our ancestors, like a gorilla? And I'm not talking about evolution. Okay. I'm not trying to break up a bunch of religion. I'm not talking about a... science. Anyway. So, yep. She's broken today. I'm sorry. She uh, she did some magic mushrooms uh, before the show. So, she's a little trippy. So, I deeply I'm apologize a really for that. Long day. But, yeah. But anyway, this gets us to our last segment of the day, which is scary stuff in the news. And this I'm, scary stuff yep. in and, the news. I feel I'm, like we eventually need to have kind of like a little like music intro. Once we make money with this, absolutely. So scary stuff in the news is kind of going with this. The Yeti's footprint. An Indian <gasps> army mocked over the claim Ooh. on April 30th, 2019. This happened. The Indian army 
has claimed to have found a footprint of the Yeti, sparking jokes and disbelief on social media. What year is this? The Army, I just told you already, the Army tweeted <laughs> to its nearly 6 million followers on Monday that it had discovered mysterious footprints of the mythical beast, the Yeti, at the base of the Himalayan mountains. The Yeti, a giant ape-like creature, often figured in South Asian folklore, there is no evidence proving the Yeti exists. However, this footprint has left people stumped. Mm. So, even to this day, they are still finding possible evidence of such a creature existing. Interesting. Now, Thomas, do you believe that this creature still exists today due to the evidence found? I don't. If not through evolution, then no. But something that is possible. If not through evolution, then no. But something like that is possible. So Carol Ann okay, says, okay. Yeah, if yeah, not yeah, through yeah. evolution, then no. I think I agree. <laughs> I don't know why this statement is so hard for me to read right now. So, You're drunk. yes, I do believe that whether it's through evolution or not, I think there could be existing an ape that that's that. Thing. I think yeah. you one hundred percent agree with Carolyn. Yeah, you're I, I believe it's just like how the sentence is written. But, but something you know. like that is possible. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. And it's also it's like the myth. And this is what's so cool about spirits and ghost stories. Now let me finish this thought before you butt in. Um, is the fact that through all of our journeys and everything that we've done and all the research, it's so cool to see like example is like we researched the hell out of Celtic mythology through like four or five episodes and to realize like how they build stories and stuff. And you can take almost like a game of telephone and it's like, how do you get a Kapow Ushka mm -hmm. or a Kelpie mm -hmm. or how do you get the Snallygaster or Mothman? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, you start with this thing that was real, but over time it mm -hmm. becomes this mythological thing, you know, could Sasquatch or the Yeti, be something that was real at one point in time mm -hmm. but then you know through the storytelling it grew into being something else something 100%. more mythical yes if you will right um ex like a unicorn what is a unicorn yeah like I, I i don't know to me that's what's so interesting about it but then again it's like science can prove so many things and i know because we have a scientist like listening to this right now but there's always that weird like oh shit i don't know that's the creepy part right Right. And uh, Amityville horror freaked me out so much because like the logical part of your brain where it's like no one could explain this, even the cops and the scientists are like, I don't know what happened. Right. Here. And the priest didn't want anything to do with it. The pastor or whatever yeah. was just like, cops oh, I'm not out. touching that. Yep. The, the cops were freaked out. The priest wouldn't go in there. It was weird. It's a documented case who, by the way, we're going to do this probably next year. The individual that was put away for the murders died recently in prison. Whoa. They don't know the complications of why he died, though. What? He died in prison. They don't know why. They don't know why he died? Nope. They're going to do an autopsy. Um, how recent is this? Like this week? The uh, past couple of months. <laughs> I just heard about it. But anyway, that's going to be another episode. But the point okay. is, that was creepy. Crazy. And then you have this Dante Pass incident where a couple of members did die of hypothermia. Mm -hmm. But then why did they tear themselves out of the tent in a rush? There was yeah. no avalanche. Great question. There was no fire. Right. How were a couple of members brutally savaged physically, but there's no trace? And the Aborigine people, they've been wiped clean, but they didn't do it. And yet these people, the ones that did just die of frostbite, sometime before they died were cognitive enough to tear themselves out of the tent, run like hell, pause, think, oh shit, we got to go back, and then go back to the tent. Mm -hmm. If the tent was on fire, you wouldn't go back to it. Right. If it was an ambulance, you would go back to it, which meant you were scared or terrified about something that happened. Right. Something's and going on. A, a couple members were brutally, like, brutally savaged. I don't know. Right. It, to me, it makes me think there's something else there. And the radiation, that was the weird thing, too. That's the weirdest part is the radiation. Yeah. Of it. The radiation. It's so supernatural. It is. It's so supernatural. And the fact that the average is How people, do they even think to test the radiation? I, I Soviet Union, baby. I don't know. Okay. And, and just like all that together. And the fact that Aboriginal people are terrified of that mountain and believe in like this mythical quality right. of like the Yeti there. Right. So I'm just, I don't know. I don't like this. This whole story was really cool. I hope you guys liked it. Yeah. In other words, it's all through evolution. Yeah, no, Caroline. No, I understand. Like, I agree. okay, that makes more sense. I'm um, sorry. Caroline also says here. Thomas struggles reading English. Humans and Megalodons didn't exist together. False. Um, <laughs> False. 
Well, I like, oh, Carolyn, I like Carolyn, we'll take this offline. We'll talk. We'll talk later. We'll talk later. <laughs> In other words, it's all through evolution. No, 100 percent. I agree with that. 100 percent. I agree through evolution. It, it could exist um, okay. through that. No, the Megalodon thing, because I still think like like the ocean is like we know. We Every know. time you say that, I think of Jason Statham. The Megalodon. Okay, he says right. it like that. All I know totally is that and Caroline would, would probably agree with this statement that we know more about Mars and the moon than we do about our oceans. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. And right. the fact is, I do love how scientists were so freaking sure about like, did you know great white sharks cannot get over 20 feet? They can't get over 20 feet. Well, scientists have found three great whites now that are over 22 feet long. So it's like, well, you fuck that up. Mm -hmm. So, right. And the idea of like animals like this can't grow any bigger. Why would they limit them? Anyway, the point is to say, like, you're right. Did humans and megalodons probably exist together? Probably not. But maybe a megalodon didn't exist, but it was a gigantic great white. Mm -hmm. Because you're right. Yeah. But again, I'm, I'm talking about... Do those like, gigantic great whites still exist? Whole different topic. Whole different Probably. topic. But spoilers, we are doing a shark attack episode because I have a lot of fun stories that we're going to talk about there that Tom is loves graphic sharks. and dark. Um, but this was episode 33. Yep. Uh, we're over eight months. Uh, we, again, I do apologize that we kind of messed up on a week. I really do. Uh, I'm really sorry about that. But uh, yeah, I think we're back into it now. We're back into the groove. Yeah. Um, and then next week, we have a really cool story. I'm going to hint at this now. It's about the woods. It's about the forest. It's called The Red Eyes. That's all. It's That's just all the red I was eyes. Say. All right. Because it's, it's, it's very interesting. Oh, and then we have a bonus episode coming out next week, too. It's a short episode because I cannot find a lot of stories about it. Okay. I tried really hard this past week. This I'm going to give a bunch away because this is going to be a, just a bonus episode that we do because it'll probably be like 20 minutes wrong. All right. It's the the bird of Ukraine because Ukraine is the thing going on right now. It is the black bird of Chernobyl. Right. Um, it goes with the whole Mothman mythology. Oh. I tried so hard this past week to find information and a nice story you about it. Find anything. Couldn't find anything. But I mm -hmm. thought we'd go through the history and timeline. So what we'll probably do is we are we're going to record that separate probably just before we do our other recording and then okay. we'll just like launch that too as a little bonus thing because like it's cool information i don't know where to put it okay. but there's no story so it's like we basically talk for about 10 minutes about it and then it's done so i think we'll just launch it as a little bonus thing and okay. then be done with it but yeah okay. the blackbird of chernobyl it's a harbinger of death and that is based off of the harbinger of death is actually based off of the celtic mythology about these things that would actually present um death coming I love which that. was in the form of the banshee the banshee Woo! Oh, that's so smart. And then from that mythology that came over to the United States uh -huh. is where Mothman came from. But also that spread that Celts. Remember how I said they were in Germany? Yeah. And in that Ural area, mm -hmm. that's also in the Ukraine area. Mm -hmm. And so that Celtic mythology of a harbinger uh... of doom. So when Chernobyl happened, people saw this winged dark bird that somehow like coincidentally came around when the reactors blew. Mothman. Just like Mothman, where the bridge gave and all those people died. Right. So it's very interesting how there's a connection there that they've been seen and like the shape of this creature is kind of like the same thing. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. No story that we have, but I want to talk about the timeline about um the Blackbird of Ukraine just because of what's going on. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. Uh my name is Thomas Aarons. I'm Carla Bird. This is Spirits and Ghost Stories, episode 33. Bye. Bye. <laughs>